how do societies regulate emotions? How does culture have an effect on how we express ourselves? Is it so easy to define good emotions and bad emotions? These are the questions historian and anthropologist William Reddy sets out to answer in the influential book The Navigation of Feeling. Reddy is concerned that academics lack the language to talk about how emotions are expressed and judged in our respective societies. Many academics, historians and anthropologists in particular, avoid making value judgments about the culture or period they're studying. Rather, they aim to simply describe. Postmodernism has also had an influence on how and if we make those value judgments. If good and bad, for example, are culturally specific and historical, rather than having any universal, unchanging definition, it becomes difficult to employ them to pass judgment on a political system, for example, because I have no objective, unbiased position from which to make the valuation. Central to Reddy's concern about cultural relativism and post-structuralism is that if culture and values are socially constructed, then there can be no possible political grounds on which culture can be criticised. Anthropologists have found strong evidence that emotions are expressed differently depending on the period and place you live in. For anthropologists like Catherine Lutz and Abu Lukod, emotion must be interpreted as in and about social life and tied to relations of power as well as to sociability. I've talked about this in another video here. And while psychologists have difficulty in defining what emotions actually are, how they're expressed, how they're measured, and what about them is universal, Reddy finds that there's a rough consensus that they're culturally specific, vary greatly, but are ultimately overlearned cognitive habits. Cognitive meaning that they're not unconscious, uncontrollable, hardwired, bodily, mystical, or reptilian, but are a product of conscious intellectual reasoning that's become habitual over time. Rather than rationality and emotion being opposed phenomena, like Descartes' mind-body split, emotions and cognition are intertwined. They are, some psychologists have argued, cogmotion. That is, they're not irrational or tripped like wires, they are directed, useful, and can be learned, altered or unlearned by conscious decision. Cognition is deeply influenced by social interaction though. Emotions are also tied to our goals, they have goal relevance. They're not hardwired, but with some effort can be learned to be changed, manipulated, controlled or expressed in different ways, depending on what our goals are. These observations from psychology lead Reddy to acknowledge a number of universal facts about emotion. First, it's universal that physical emotions, feelings, prospects and goals all interact in a dynamic way. Most psychologists also agree that emotions have a valence or hedonic tone that makes them either pleasant or unpleasant to the person experiencing them, although most also acknowledge that this is complex. Finally, we all use language and expression to try and communicate emotions to each other, or even to ourselves. Thinking, I'm angry, for example, has an effect on the process of anger. For Reddy, these universal factors come together in two main ways emotives and emotional regimes. Emotives are an attempt to translate feelings in the body into language and expression. Central to that cultural relativism and post-structuralism is the idea that there's no necessary link between the signifier, like the word anger, and the signified, the feeling of anger, the pulsing heart, the release of adrenaline, etc. He argues that while the link is tenuous and doomed in some way to fail, because we can never really translate exactly how we feel, this is in some way also successful as a translation. The brain translates between different phenomena, sights, language, emotions, etc. all the time. Recognising an outline of a bird for a bird, for example, is an act of translating a symbol. He argues that we should think of translations rather than signs. Rather than there being no link between the signifier and the signified, this invites a discussion about the nature of the translation. He points out that there's always coordination and translation between the five senses. Being in love, for example, requires the mind to translate between a number of linguistic, visual, bodily and social codes in order to decide how to act, as does deciding when or why one should be angry or sympathetic or upset. 
So emotives are an attempt to translate the physical emotion into language. But Reddy goes further by drawing upon J.L. Austin's speech act theory. For Austin, there are two types of speech. Constative, descriptive statements like leaves are green, and performatives, productive statements that accomplish something like saying I do at your wedding. Emotion utterances, though, Reddy argues, are neither descriptive nor performative. They are in some ways both and in some ways different. Emotives are descriptive. They attempt to describe or translate how a person feels. But they're also relational. They're often about social life, negotiating emotionally with someone, working out how one should feel. Emotives are also self-exploratory. They're often about working through how one feels and why. So they're an outward expression of something inside, but what's outside social and cultural life also affects them. As historian Rob Bodice puts it, emotives are an attempt to translate inward feelings through cultural conventions in order to try to match the two. Emotional regimes are Reddy's answer to how this occurs. Because emotions are cognitive and a part of the dense network of goals that are also social, communities, groups, families, workplaces, societies, etc. give emotions a high priority. In other words, there are emotional expectations within social groups. He writes that emotional regimes provide individuals with prescriptions and counsel concerning both the best strategies for pursuing emotional learning and the proper endpoint or ideal of emotional equilibrium. Individuals are meant to master their emotions according to a social, cultural or political standard. He continues, Because emotions are closely associated with the dense network of goals that give coherence to the self, the unity of a community, such as it may be, depends in part on its ability to provide a coherent set of prescriptions about emotions. An emotional regime, then, is the set of normative emotions and the official rituals, practices and emotives that express and inculcate them. It's a necessary underpinning of any stable political regime. Reddy argues that in strict regimes, a limited number of emotives are modelled through ceremony or official art forms. Individuals are required to utter these emotives in appropriate circumstances, in the expectation that normative emotions will be enhanced and habituated. Those who refuse to make the normative utterances, whether of respect for a father, love for a god or a king or loyalty to an army, are faced with the prospect of severe penalties. Strict regimes use social, political and cultural pressure on emotives in the hope of shaping emotions. They might include Stalinist Russia or France under Louis XIV. Chinese state pressure on the Uyghurs and the recent stoning laws in Brunei also come to mind. At the other end of the spectrum, Reddy argues, are regimes like liberal societies. And he's been accused here of being Eurocentric, by the way. They may have strict regimes in certain institutions, like the army or the church, but are largely open enough to allow emotional navigation without conflict within. That's not to say that emotional regimes in liberal countries might not be influenced economically, say. Unequal societies might have strict regimes in which you're expected to show an emotional attachment to products out of your budget, for example. All of this, Reddy argues, allows us to make political judgments about cultural practices. He argues that his framework allows us to see what's at stake for the individual in submitting to such institutions, in accepting and feeling the emotions prescribed. It gives us a basis for criticising systems that force individuals to engage in struggles to match their emotional expression to the strict norms of the community. Individuals who fail to conform may be marginalised or severely sanctioned. Historian Jan Plamper gives the example of the peasant son in Stalinist USSR who has to denounce his parents to the secret police. Reddy gives us the tools to make an ethical judgement about such a system. But it's not always as simple as that. Being a historian himself, in part two, Reddy turns to the French Revolution. He argues that the regime of Louis XIV was so strict that emotional refuges developed in salons, Freemasons' lodges, in a burgeoning of emotional, sentimental novels. This network and the culture that developed led to the overthrow of the monarchy, but also led to a new culture that put a premium on sentimentalism, authenticity, passion. He argues that this in turn failed because it put pressure on citizens to conform to this new emotional regime, that if they weren't emotional and compassionate and sincere enough, they'd be sent to the guillotine under the terror. 
The navigation of feeling has been hugely influential across disciplines for rethinking what was thought of as an impasse between universalism and cultural relativism. It certainly has its faults, and you might not buy into each intricate part of the argument, but in sum, Reddy's uniqueness and overall conclusions are difficult to ignore. If you like these videos, I need your help, and here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month, and if you pledge five dollars, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support Then and Now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping Then and Now grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.